State calls case number RC seven seven two of twenty three State versus Bapana Mahungela Appearances today being the twentieth of December the year twenty twenty three are as follows the presiding officer is Ms. Prinslow. Public prosecutor is Mr. Bagana. There is no interpreter since the applicant understands and they will be proceeding in English. Yeah. And on behalf of the applicant, it is Advocate Masako. Matter was remanded until today for purposes of the state to proceed with its case. With regard, with regard to the state case, the state will read into the record an affidavit by one of the state witnesses. It reads as follows. I grant Mulder state under oath in English as follows. Before I proceed, it is uh, the state's intention to provide my learned colleagues with the copies of these statements. But 20 minutes ago, there was a problem with our machine. I don't know whether we need to attend. I'll, I'll send someone to go and find out what is happening. But I'm of the view that we can proceed. What the state will do before handing the state membership will, hand, will actually give to the defense. Mm -hmm. I think I've adjusted to the getting of the documents and think of the cuff at the time. Uh, it, it's, it's already the kind of practice in here. And uh, it is not starting now, it has been like that. I understand my learned colleague wants to read it. We cannot prevent him from reading, but we'll get a statement afterwards and. And, and see how we swim or sink in this ocean of darkness is creating for us. But having said what I said, uh, Your Worship, may I ask for permission? I know my client suffers from some kind of dehydration, and he asked me to bring me, to bring him some water. Can can I give it to him, please? Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Worship. I'm great in that sense. It's fine. We'll get the affidavit. And will we be granted an opportunity to can ponder on it at least for some time? Thank you, Worship. Okay. As a court business, I grant Molda state under oath in English as follows. I am an adult male. ID number 69 one, two. Twenty four seven security number eight Pilo Road. Conduct numbers. On 29 October 2023, I received a call from our control room. Stating that a deceased female body had been found at the Santin Sports Club. at George Lee Park in Parkmore. We are contracted to guard this installation. And I was the duty officer. And was conducted by our control room. I proceeded to the crime scene. On my arrival, it was established that Kirsten Clay was deceased. and her naked body was found on an embankment next to a running path. And it appeared that she had been murdered. Mm. 
All her clothes. And shoes. Were not found. At the crime scene. It was established that her car keys and cell phone were discovered on the running path. Adjacent to where the body was found. <coughs> she had been pulled down into a bushy area. down an embankment. The phone was picked up by a runner Mr. West Pal. The runner's name is Mr. West Pal. Is W E S T P H A L. At around zero eight eighteen. <laughs> At the time, thought someone had dropped their phone, according to his statement. Who was participating with a few other runners. In an event called the My Run, the fourth paragraph. I received a picture of the victim which was taken on the day where the victim <coughs> can be seen wearing a light blue top black pants, sunglasses, and a tan pig cap. <coughs> she can also be seen carrying her cell phone in the picture.
this picture has a time stamp of 0805. and was taken by Manuela de Nobraga Robla. At the start point on the victim's third lap around the circuit, The fifth paragraph. We started an investigation to assist the SAPS. And obtained footage from a few premises in the area. This was done in conjunction with my IT specialist, employed by 24-7, Lebohang Trevor Bokoshi. I started with Sandhurst Preparatory School, which has a camera looking at the Western Pedestrian Gate. of George Lee Park. Around 50 meters from where the body was found. Around 31 October 2023. Around 31 October 2023. Full stop. On this camera, I found an African male, mm. African. A living African male, living the area. Why is so In the vicinity of the body, at around 08.49, Real time on 29 October 2023. Wearing a blue shirt, a dark hat, and carrying something black in his left hand. Full stop. Paragraph six. On Monday, the 13th of November, 2023, we obtained 
and downloaded footage from 89 Olympia Avenue. And on the real time, it is estimated at 08.52 that a person jumped out of the park. over a locked gate near the corner of Olympia Avenue. Wearing a blue shirt and carrying items which were thrown over the gate before he jumped over the gate. He heads down Holt Street. He heads down Hold Street. Is age O L T towards Virginia Road, Pagmo. Full stop. Paragraph seven. On around the 14 November 2023, I discovered footage that was downloaded from 78th Street, Pagmo. where a person is seen wearing a light a blue top. Resembling the victim's top. A dark hat and sunglasses. and is still carrying something that looks like clothing in his right hand. We then went to 72 8th Street, Pagmo. Where I obtained clear footage on this footage I can observe a tattoo on his right arm above his right elbow the shirt has a pattern around the sleeve which is also visible on the victim's sleeve. (coughs) 
in this footage. I could say that the hat was navy blue in color. and has a white rim and a logo on the head. The person's face is visible and he is wearing sunglasses and has shoes with writing on them. Paragraph eight. We also obtained footage from the bottom cameras. May I just indicate, I think the spelling is actually boom ca cameras. On Holt Road, near the entrance, on the Sentin Sport Club, on the eastern side of George Lee Park, on the 14th of, of November, the year 2023. And established that a person with the same pants, hat, and shoes was visible on those cameras and has a tattoo on his right arm but is wearing a black t-shirt and can be identified as the same person. His tattoo extends <coughs> around his right arm above his right elbow. On these cameras the person can be seen behind the victim going into the Sentin Sports Club at the open gate at the gym entrance at around 0806 and is approximately one minute, 30 seconds behind the victim. <clears throat> Just before he entered the gate, he takes what appears to be a picture of the entrance gate with his cell phone and was also looking around towards the victim, the victim's root inside the club.
paragraph 9. On Monday, the 20th of November 2023, I received information that the suspect was standing under a tree outside number 125 8th Street, Pagmo for around three minutes on the day of the murder, which seemed suspicious. As on all other footage, he was walking. This bothered me. On the 25th of November, 2023, I spoke to the private investigator, Glass Mulibalo, who at this stage has joined the investigation mandated by the deceased family and asked him to go to the above mentioned address. He checked a stormwater drain and he found the victim's hat in the drain. Paragraph 10. We downloaded the footage from the address and determined that the same person disposed of the victim's hat and other items in the drain. He then moved back to see if the items were visible from the road. He pushed more items in the drain and dropped what looked to be clothing. He then put that clothing into the left side of the, of the drain and proceeded to walk up 8th Street. The father of the victim is paragraph 11. The father of the victim did send me a reference picture of the hat and it matches the one found in the drain. The Sentin SAPS duty detective came out and put the hat into an evidence bag and booked it in at the station. And the I.O. was informed
paragraph 12. On Sunday, the 26th of November, the year 2023, I accompanied the investigation officer to number 145 8th Street, Pagmore, which was established to be a possible address of the suspect. The SAPS investigating officer arrested the suspect and found clothing matching the footage at the suspect's residence. He was later detained at Sentin SAPS. Paragraph 13, I know and understand the content of the statement. I have no objection against the taking of the prescribed oath. I found the prescribed oath to be binding on my conscience. <clears throat> I will humbly request that uh, before handing the statement, I give my learned colleague, legal team, an opportunity to have it. But what I've, what I've done, as I was busy uh, reading the statement into the record, the second statement that I'll be reading, I've made sure that the copies for my colleagues, that is the legal team, is made. May I respond? Worship, um, I think um, logic dictating itself to common sense is that we're still trying to digest uh, the first affidavit. It defeats the purpose because once he gives us the second one, whilst we still have to read that first one. We humbly request that it's okay, let him proceed to read both of them. He'll give both of them after reading all of them. To us, have a short adjournment, read both of them, because what's going to happen? And it's, a, it's common sense, we'll be distracted. Once he gives us this one, we're still thinking about the other one. So uh, fairness prevailing would guide us that the best to be done in this circumstance, let him keep them for now and divorce us from that. We'll marry with them at the right, right time. I'll proceed then. The second statement. I, Aubrey Chisani, state under oath in English as follows. I am a detective sergeant. In the South African Police Service. Stationed at Sentin 02 Summit. A morning side. I am the investigating officer on the Sentin Cars number 797, stroke 10, stroke 2023. Murder of Kirsten Glaze at George Le Park, Pagmore on the 29th October 2023, while jogging with others. Hmm? Paragraph 3. 
how it was. Apologies, Chef. I'm just distracted. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just the, distracted. I'm, I'm the cause for it because um, I'm trying to tell Martinez what to write and not to write. I'm sorry about it. It's me. I know. Mea culpa, mea culpa. While jog jogging with others, Chef. Paragraph three. I was tasked to investigate the above matter as the member who was on standby. for serious and violent crime investigation, full stop. Paragraph four, during the crime scene visit, I was informed that the deceased was jogging with others while they were running and she was walking reason being that she was pregnant. While running, one witness picked the cell phone from the ground around 08.15 a.m. and handed it to the timekeeper who is also the witness on this matter? And count their laps during running. Next paragraph. After everyone finished their laps, it was discovered that One lady did not complete her laps and they started their own investigation for log out of this lady. They then went back to where the phone was found and conduct their own search. And the body of the lady, that is the deceased in bracket, was found on the bushes, wrapped and naked. Next paragraph. All role or role players were called to attend the scene and body was removed thereafter from the scene to Hillbrow Mutual. Next paragraph. During the attendance of the postmortem, I was informed by the pathology doctor that the cause of death was blunt force head trauma, strangulation, smothering, or pressure to the neck cannot be excluded. Next paragraph. After the postmortem was attended, I went back to the, to the crime scene to investigate and gather evidence to assist trace the suspect. On arrival at the scene, 
I was informed about the camera. which is at Sandhurst Preparatory College School, which is next to the crime scene. 40 of the day of the crime committed was viewed and saw an individual coming wearing a blue t-shirt carrying something on his hands on the side or next to the crime scene. And more footage was collected on the surroundings after seeing the first footage to track down this individual. Next paragraph. Witness statement was then taken from the people involved during the jogging, where it was established that the timekeeper took a photo of the deceased when she had to do her last lap at 08.05 a.m and deceased was wearing a blue t-shirt, glasses, black trouser with white stripe on the side, a brown cap, watch on the left arm, a black shoes with white sole, and also carrying cell phone on her left arm with earphones. <laughs> Next paragraph. Camera footage was viewed at the entrance of the park where I saw the deceased coming into the park at around 08.04 a.m. <coughs> and the pictures of her was taken by the above witness at the starting line, which is plus minus 100 meters away from the entrance. Next paragraph. I also saw an African male coming Pass the camera footage from the entrance at around 08.05 a.m. Wearing a blue tracksuit, a black t-shirt with white sticker on the left, hat with white sticker, cell phone on his right arm. Black and white shoes with writings at the bottom and having a tattoo on his right up elbow which was the time when the deceased was taken pictures by the time keeper. And uh, he, wait, he wait at the entrance, looking at his phone, and then entered inside.
after I viewed the footages and analyzed the time frames of the incident, it came to my attention that the witness picked the phone at around 08 zero fifteen AM and the deceased entered the park at zero eight zero four and the timekeeper took a pictures at zero eight zero five meaning the murder occurred in the period of plus minus eight minutes and the deceased was found naked. <coughs> I'll repeat it, Your Worship. And the deceased entered the park at 0804. And the timekeeper took her pictures at 0805. Meaning the murder occurred in the period of plus or minus eight minutes and the deceased was found naked. I then looked at the footage of the person entering at the park wearing a black t shirt. And the one wearing a deceased t-shirt and saw that it was the same person. I followed this person, that is the next paragraph. I followed this person on different camera footage and I saw this African male throwing a cap inside the drain and went back to check if someone can be able to see it from the distance and he also threw another cloth which looks like a panty inside the drain investigation continued and the drain was opened and recovered the cap which belongs to the deceased and the other items were not found. At this point in time, informers were tasked and suspect was identified and arrested by the name of Bafana Mahungela at his place of residence at number 145 8th Street, Parkmore. And he was shown a picture of the person wearing a blue t-shirt and he confirmed to be him. I then concluded that the suspect was following the, dis the deceased on the day of the murder by looking at the footage, witness statement of the person who picked the cell phone on the ground and at the time frame of both the accused and the deceased of entering the park and planned to kill her. Together 
with the information received that the disease was part of the jogging every time it happened. I concluded the suspect may be motor, uh, monit monitoring the deceased and planned to murder him. And I measured the suspect distance from his place of residence to the park, which gave me plus minus 1,4 kilometers by using the route he used after the commission of crime. The suspect was remanded in custody after his appearance and matter was postponed for bail application. <coughs> I therefore opposed bail of the accused person as the accused planned to murder the deceased. Cast in place. And he wore her t shirt after murdering her and raping her. My apologies, she was actually not raping, is wrapped. I'll, I'll repeat this. And he wore her t shirt after murdering her, wrapped the body to cover her from being seen, and destroyed the evidence by throwing it inside the drain. If the suspect can be released on bail, members of the public community will be on danger. And also the safety of himself, the suspect, the suspect must remain in custody. I know and understand the content of the statement. I have no objection at taking the prescribed oath. I consider the prescribed oath to be binding in my conscience. We, this is the second statement. As a court, this is, we have been able as a state as an application was made to make copies of the two statements for my landed colleagues. It will be the state case, Your Ship. It is the state case, actually. No, I, I have revisited uh, my thoughts. I thought the affidavit would be coming with something out of this world which would change the complexion. Um, court allow, if court allows me to be flexible, um, I can start my argument now, adjourn to deal with material inconsistencies and other things containing the two affidavits as I continue with my argument. Can I start? <coughs> right. Um, may we hand in our copy of the heads of argument. That will be one for the prosecution, then one for the honorable magistrate. There's no accused, unfortunately, that I would have given him on the other side. But he will listen. 
Um, what kind of, what are you guys going to do with this? Uh, do you want to copy? Huh? Um, just one copy. And the minute in which you guys are sitting, no, it's, okay. it's fine. As, as the introduction to our heads of argument, I think um, it is logical that I must start by showing that the affidavits presented amount to absolutely nothing and they don't resolve this matter and they do not even at least try to assist this court. I haven't seen the, the, the affidavits, but I want to check something which I can tell the court before I proceed. If one looks at the Commissioner of Oaths <coughs> stem, one will realize that it mentions the following. Uh, I don't know which statement did they start with? Uh, the statement of who, who is this? Grant Mulder. I know and understand the contents of the statement. I have no objection against taking the prescribed oath. I find the prescribed oath to be binding on my conscience. And it has to further still say, aware that the facts are within my personal knowledge and where they uh, indicate otherwise, that would be facts which I receive from a third party. Because we need to remember vividly, bail application, like, unlike a trial, does allow hearsay to be heard. But my learned colleague must produce authority which says double hearsay and hearsay of other people who never gave any affidavits before a court can be seen to be reliable and is the veracity of it counts for something. That's the first thing. Let's be understood. Hearsay evidence is allowed, but once you refer to third parties, that it's no more hearsay. It becomes double hearsay, or third hearsay, fourth hearsay. Now they have to answer, and they'll get the opportunity. As to why they didn't secure other confirmatory affidavits from those primary sources. Second issue which I wish to deal with is that, may I go back to the issue which I dealt with when I raised preliminary objections. What did my learned colleague say in his own words? I, I now read. The state prosecutor said, I quote him, it is the state submission Further, there were items, property that belonged to the deceased, that were taken, allegedly running shoes, sunglasses, a t-shirts, and the pants of the deceased. The state at the present moment is still busy with further investigations. Fortunately, at this stage, the PM report is available, and in terms of it, the cause of death, of death is as follows. It is an unknown blunt force, a head trauma, strangulation, smoothering, as well as pressure of the neck. My learned colleague proceeded to say the following. The, uh, the deceased body was found naked. Then he further says this, and I wish the court to note this. If there is a red pen, I humbly request the honorable court to use its red pen on this point. The state alleged that video footage obtained showed Mahungela following Kristen Clade at some stage, leaving the place where her body was found. The same footage allegedly showed 
Mr. Mongela jumping over a locked gate and before that he was captured, apparently throwing away some of her clothes. He was allegedly also seen wearing her t-shirt. Fundamental question to be asked is, was he acting honestly, fairly to the defense and the accused person about saying, and, and it is a vow, we must remember and not lose sight of the fact that for us to be acting as advocates, we took an oath. And we know what the oath stands for. Among other things, I shall not lie. I shall ensure at all relevant material times the truth and nothing else but the truth shall be. And I shall remind myself from time to time that I'm a public servant who has to serve with and, 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 and really show elements of trust, credibility, good reputation, and be an agent of the NPA, not the BWK. See, the National Prosecuting Act shall be my guiding act, code of conduct, and there is also a book on ethical guidelines. I know it's written by, among others, the late Mr. Jan Yenner, who was an acting national DPP before Mr. Mukotidim Pierre could be. Now, this video footage is of crucial importance. Why? All these things which are averred, no, 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 before, before coming to that. To proceed, I write a letter to my learned colleague, asking what? To see the video. And that's what I also requested from Mr. Mafiri, the prosecutor who was dealing with the matter in court two. On the 5th of December, Mr. Mafiri said to me, and I can personally say from the bar, as an officer of this honorable court, that the gentleman who's sitting next to, on the left side of the prosecutor, I'm not sure if he's the, the one who um, deposed of an affidavit. When we were in Mr. Mafiri's office, he said, with greatest respect, may I raise a concern? The concern from the side of the state, or the question, what is the obligation of my learned colleague? My understanding is the following. At this stage, all that we need to do is to address the court with regard to a judgment. Now, I, I, I'm confused because the very same <coughs> Government that he is making, it was made long ago. I was, and I'm still of the view that we needed the state to address this honorable court with regard to the evidence that is before this honorable court. I really don't know, maybe if we can understand, because I'm confused now. The state have closed this case. Before that, the defense closed its case. The state was given an opportunity. State have closed its case. Now, we need to assist the Honorable Court with regard to the merits or the facts that are before this Honorable Court. If I can be assisted in that regard. Mr. Masako? Your Worship, I will recall, the issue of the video footage was set in this court. I'm giving a background. The issue about the video footage, not uh, the change of heart by the prosecution, that they no more had the video footage, they were going to use photos, was set in this court. The issue now shows its ugly face in the affidavits. Now, should I leave that unattended? Thank you, my person. Thank you very much. And the confusion of my learned colleague. I think it's pressure. He has to relax, pull his thoughts together. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now, the essence of what I'm saying is that the issue about the video footage 
was raised with Mr. Mafia. The gentleman who's moving out of court now showed me on his phone some photos. As to where do they come from, I don't know. And I said it earlier on. I'm going to object again. As I addressed this court last time, I'm not Mafiri. Whatever was discussed by the defense and Mafiri, I was not there. And again, I would like to mention this before this Panama court ship, so that it can be noted. The very same day that my learned colleague addressed this court about this Mafiri, Mafiri confronted him, and I was called by two of them disputing what my learned colleague is saying about this Mafiri. I don't think it's relevant. It's hearsay. I was not there. Otherwise, Mr. Mafiri, he needs to call him to come and testify with regard to that. I was not part and parcel of that. I can't believe that uh, when I'm addressing an argument, I can be interrupted like this. It's totally out of order, if I may put it to you. The, the purpose of me bringing this is to show that the previous uh, prosecutor who, who dealt with the matter promised the video footage. <laughs> My learned colleague, when I came for the first time on the 13th and with my attin, changed and said the video footage was not going to be utilized, but photos would, would be uh, instead of the video footage. Now, the relevance of that is that in the affidavits now, we are referred to a video footage which was not shown in court. Do we find that to be fair? I respectfully submit that it is not. The video footage information is only known by the prosecution, the state, and BDK. We didn't see the video footage. The court hasn't seen the video footage. Therefore, any finding made by this honor court hinging on the video footage shall be found to be assailable. That's a point I wish to make. But also, it goes to the ethics. Let's try, at all costs, be it a bail application and, 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 or a trial. The right to a trial, which is enshrined in the Constitution in 35 and 34, that the accused person, when bringing an application, has to be granted a fair hearing. This fair hearing has been prejudiced by all these tricks which have been played in, in a court of law. Authority, and if this matter, really, if this public which is referred to, hears all this, it creates sensation. That's, that's another point which I, made, I wish to make. Now, Let's agree and let it be common cause that no video footage was shown. And in this statement, any information referring to the video footage with respect, Your Worship, has to be expunged. This is another point which I wish to make. That was just nothing else but an introduction. A proper introduction comes now. Why are we here? We are here for nothing else. Liberty of a young man who's 21 years of age coming to pray before this honorable court for what? Equal justice and sympathy. And why is it doing that? Section 9 of the Constitution, which is the supreme law of this country, spells it very clearly that we are all equal before the law and we deserve equal protection before the law. And I'm not talking about formal equality, I'm referring to substantive equality. High court cases, uh, no, in fact, constitutional court cases have dealt a great deal about Section 9. And I need not to belabor this point any further. What 
is this case not all about? In our humble submission, this case is not all about the charges preferred, which are murder, premeditated, preplanned murder. If one looks at what the state relies on to back the issue or to create a basis for the pre-planned, premeditated man, uh, matter is, and I wish to remind this honorable court, during cross-examination, I never heard a word from my learned colleague that at any stage you had an intention to kill this person and you wanted to kill her on this day and when was this intention formed? And for what good reason to kill this person? And the issue about knowing this person for the very first time when she was under a rag was not disputed. No cross-examination said you knew her three months before, a year before. You and her had a quarrel about one, two, three, nothing should be noticed. What the state rely, relies on on that? Is it the statement of the I.O. or the I.O.? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, uh, really. If it's not far-fetched, it's remote. And if it's not remote, it's fanciful. And I'm saying that with the greatest respect. There's a lot I can say, but I think I'll cut my sh myself short for purpose of ensuring that all the points which I intend to make are being covered. Let's now come to robbery with a gravity circumstance. Evidence which is before this on court is that the accused in his viva voce, not affidavit, and really if you were to compare an affidavit with viva voce, what has to supersede? Common sense tells us that Viva Voca has to. Why does it have to supersede the affidavit? It's because he was subjected to cross-examination. The court had an opportunity to observe his demeanor. The court had an opportunity to check. And these, all these things about credibility, you know, they are for the trial court. But we, as frank and honest as we are, we said we fear absolutely nothing. Go into the box, tell the truth. The crux of his truth is as follows. Admitting to the blue t-shirt which belongs to the deceased, the clothes which he threw in the drain, which were later discovered. We even showed that that T-shirt, uh, powder, is a sky blue T-shirt. It's of the value of approximately 250. That was not disputed. And even in the affidavits, nothing. Why am I following this trail of thought? It's precisely because I want to show this on the court. And I also wish to remind the honorable court about M1 and M2, which was only, and the court has the originals, we need to have copies of those, M1 and M2. M1 refers to 1003, which is the timeline which does not marry, tally, or which is not consonant with what the affidavits are saying. So they don't speak to each other. Why? But they belong to the same case number, the same investigating officer, the same prosecutor in the same court in Alexandria who have the expertise of reading the docket and understand it fully well. But what's even disturbing about M2, which shows that there were no genital injuries, is that it's marked in red. And what's even more shocking about it is lack of honesty about it. It's marked in red. We had to push to get because the issue of pregnancy was only introduced during cross-examination. 
And had we not asked on what basis is the state relying on, uh, on what's, uh, what's the basis of the state saying she was pregnant, we wouldn't have known. And even when we requested, they were still holding the document up until we requested it. And by sheer luck, we got it. And what would have happened if we never got that? The court wouldn't have known the truth to the prejudice of the accused. Now, what this case is not about is that it is not about murder premeditated, preplanned. It is not about robbery with aggravating circumstances. Why do I say that? Simple. Viva Voke evidence says, I found this person covered in a red, dead facing the wall. Curiosity which, killed, which kills the cat became, became his problem. Went there, touched the body, and I'm not going to repeat what he said. He said it loud and clear. Now, find out, the, the crucial question now becomes, if you find a body in a dead state, <coughs> By undressing it, hiding the clothing, wearing uh, the deceased uh, top, can that, be, can that satisfy the elements of robbery? I don't know, not the robbery which I know from a book called Sneeman. I think now is that this sixth edition. The elements are very clear. You apply force. To a person, hurt them with a view of taking their property and depriving them. Now, if indeed it's robbery, what kind of robbery is this which is selective? In that it leaves the car keys, it leaves the phone. Which phone could have assisted the state to check who communicated with the deceased? What's in the WhatsApp of the deceased phone? Could have taken fingerprints also, because the version given now is that the accused person never touched that. And that's why he left. So. That could have assisted gravely. But what did they do? They funneled. They funneled. They said, ah, we've got video footages, and we'll apply our imagination, speculation, to arrive at a conclusion. The law doesn't work that way. And emotions also. The law doesn't work that way. Even in China, where they don't respect human rights, they don't behave this way. Now, let's come to the rape issue. May I not delve deeper on this issue? My simple submission is M2 resolves the issue. From their own report, what is this case all about? This case is all about a young man undressing a white lady Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, I'm jumping the gun. Um, a young, young, young man, seeing this rag, curiosity, as I alluded, checked with a view of assisting, because this person is in an unnatural position, heartbeat, checking whether they're breathing. Is that not help? Which means if this person had any hope of life, he could have resuscitated him. Because obviously, when you check heartbeat and what a view, it changes the whole complexion of this case. Now, this is about a blue 
simply put, Blue Top belonged to Christian Clays, which was taken by my client, who doesn't deny it. Even when he was arrested, he confessed to that, even when he didn't have his lawyer. And even in court, testified consistently that I took it. Now, I wish to draw court's attention to the following. If the state, which is a very powerful machinery, could just react based on what they see on a video footage and they jump to arrest somebody, arbitrarily so, what would happen to a 21 year old who does not, 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 not even know the law? Shock, anguish can make you do stupid things. And indeed, in human life, the person who coined the phrase to air is human anticipated situations like this. We are not, and we need, we need not be, armchair critics. You know, to be wise after the fact can be sometimes a fact which doesn't make us arrive at a sane conclusion. Because we, and, and that is what was said, somebody's not normal, but they're in court. If they were not normal, we could have not proceeded with the bail application. I couldn't have called him in, into the box. We would have applied section 77, 78, 79 for him to be taken to a mental hospital to be checked. But we respectfully submit that he is normal, he is sane, and his coherent, logical, convincing, unassailable version speaks for itself. Now I now deal with my heads as they stand. Where are they? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, Osha. Maybe I'll get copies of the uh, of the affidavits if 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 time allows it. Hmm? Oh, no. hmm? The copies of the affidavit. Yeah, they're here. Yeah. They're here. Yes, what do you mean then? No, 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 no you're not fighting. I'm not fighting, I'm just asking. We're not fighting, please. We're not fighting, please. You don't even say chief. You see, that is why I said you must come here to, to, to be my witness also. And if you think you have emotions, you also have emotions. We, we are not going to be scared by you. You want to talk alone? Oh, I want to talk alone. Just leave him. You know, Mrs. is going to talk until tomorrow.
on the same date? Uh, it's tomorrow, it should be the 21st of uh, December. So, are we still postponing our public meetings? Yes. State recalls case number RC seven seven two of twenty three. State versus uh, Bafana Mahongela. Appearances are as before. My learned colleague was still busy. Your Worship, I'm indebted. Worship, I have made um, so far legal pros uh, propositions and uh, without citing any authority to support what I'm saying. I now refer the Honourable Court to a book called A Guide to Bail Applications by M.T. Mugwena. It's a first edition, I guess so. And I refer this Honourable Court to page number 54, which I'll read into the record. May I proceed, Your Worship? Um, if It's a pity we do not have I'm told there's no machine, uh, there's no paper. Yeah. We would have prepared uh, the relevant pages. Unfortunately, uh, we'll read it into the record. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, now, on page 54 of M. Tumuku and a Guide to Bail Application, the following is said by the author. Um, And I read at a paragraph which is the paragraph up there. And read as follows. In legal proceedings, whether civil or criminal, it is usually the party bearing the honors of proof who also carries the burden to lead evidence first. That's what we did. In the case of, of Schedule 5 and 6 offenses, the accused is also the applicant bears the honors. The essence of section section 6011 in brackets A indicates that as far as the applicant who is affected by this provision is concerned, it is incumbent upon him or her to present his or her case first and for the prosecution to answer. And that is said in S versus Porthen and others, 2004, in brackets, to SACR 242 in Cape Town at 256. And proceeds to read, a bail application who is subject to section 6011A provisions obtains a potential and unintended ad advantage if the Inquiry is conducted in a manner which is at odds with the plain legislative intention. That is set in this and continues to read. Now he obtains a potential and unintended advantage if the inquiry is conducted <coughs> in a manner which is at odds. And we submit that this 
inquiry fits this description on all fours. I proceed to read. The question of honors in Schedule 5 or 6 offenses is not universally applicable to all offenses. As a result, in cases falling under 107, for example, the honors lies with the prosecution, which must therefore start leading evidence, common cause. The determination of the charges which the prosecution is to pursue is therefore of crucial significance in the determination of the offense before the court. That is, that's what the court held in S. versus Shabalala, 1998, Volume 2, SACR 259C, Cape Town. Such determination in the end determines who bears the honors and therefore who needs to start leading evidence. It is therefore imperative that sufficient facts should be placed before the court in order to establish it to establish whether, for example, section 6040 finds application in a given case. That was said in S. versus Stenfeld. Um, and then I'll continue to read where the prosecution relies on the provisions of section 6011 as the basis for, for its opposition to bail. It may be worthwhile to present a full charge sheet with all the particulars of the alleged offense clearly set, uh, set out. That was said in S. versus Chase in 1961, SACR 715 here in Transvaal at 718. And I continue to read, besides establishing a level of certainty regarding the content of the charges, this prevents the prosecution from presenting vague, general, and often unsubstantiated allegations which serve only to exaggerate the charges which the prosecution could actually prove. In the same vein, one should not lose sight of the technical aspect of the provisions which classify offenses as Schedule 5 or 6 or otherwise. As if this authority has not said it, I now refer um, the Honorable Court to what is called the Bible of the bail, uh, bail charges. And it's called the Bail a Practitioner's um, Guide. It's the third edition by Jon van, van der Berg. So it's, I'm reading from Mokwena. I'm now referring to um, van der Berg. And in page 63, he echoes the same sentiments. And really, these are learned colleagues. They don't just come out um, and write books without even have conducted any research. These are reliable sources. And they can know, we cannot turn a blind eye to them um, and hope that uh, uh, you know, things will be brushed aside. Now, on page exceptional circumstances, just one moment, Your Worship. I think I missed the page. Uh, yeah, Schedule 6 applications, 15. Eh? Yeah. Yes, um, on page 50, I beg your pardon, 76. It will come later on. At page 50, it reads as follows at 6.2.2 paragraph. In the previous. Um, says, uh, let me see, I said what? 56. Uh, just one moment. Yes, um, just one moment. I think I missed the page, but I can inform this on record that um, the author emphasizes the point which is made by McQueen. And if one reads the bail applications, one will realize that most of the authority relies on. Yeah, here we are. Yes. Now, let me come back to this point, just to check. 
Now, on page 63 of the same book, it said, exceptional circumstances um, do not require innocent um, a persons to be punished purely on the basis that he or she allegedly committed a gruesome offense. And that is said in S versus C, 1998 2, SACR 721, and Cape Town at 726. Right, then let me pause at that and then deal now with my heads, which I have given. I haven't looked. I haven't forgotten about Van der Berg. Heads of argument reads as follows. In the regional division of Houghton North, Heath at Alexander Court, case RC 772-23, stroke in the matter between Bafana Mahungela, the applicant, and the state. Heads of argument on behalf of the applicant. And I guess my learned colleague has been furnished with a copy and is reading with me. Can I confirm that? Thank you. Paragraph one. You wish to pardon me that I don't have a road map here because of we didn't know what's coming. And I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just indicate when necessary. The Honorable Court in ruling whether or not um, for the application for bail stood to be decided in terms of section 6011A or B of the Criminal Procedure Act. Uh, of uh, Act 51977 in bracket CPA, found by virtue of a possible head trauma to the head, the applicant should, pro uh, should proceed on the basis that the bail application was one envisaged in terms of section 1611A. Paragraph 2. However, on the possible pre planning, premeditated murder, the Honorable Court emphasized that its ruling does not imply that the applicability of Section 611 could not be revisited should the evidential uh, material to be adduced dictate or indicate otherwise. In other words, insofar as matter is concerned, the Court never made a ruling. It said it wanted to listen to the evidence and will make that decision at a later stage. Paragraph 3. It is respectfully submitted that the evidence and all evidential material in bracket seen after referred to as the evidence as a whole and in context supports the applicant's contention that he did not commit a planned or premeditated murder, robbery with aggravating circumstances, and rape. As a result, the Honorable Court is respectfully requested to find that the Present application does not fall within the ambit of Schedule 6 application as is envisaged in Section 6011A of the CPA. Paragraph 4, it is respectfully submitted that the evidence does not even show that the applicant committed any of the, of the charges and as such the application for bail should be considered as an application not even falling within the ambit of Schedule 5 of the CPA. The evidence presented at least points to a charge of either theft and or defeating the ends of justice. Accordingly, the state bears the honors to show that the interest of justice demands the applicant's continued incarceration. Five, it is, the sub it is submitted that the inference is that the state embarked on a strategy to introduce um, the provisions of Section 611A notwithstanding insufficient facts, so as to expose the applicant to the harsh tenets of Section 611A of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977, and hereafter I'll refer to it as the CPA. Six, in particular, the state had access to all the available evidence and at, at, at the very least should have known that the available evidence fell far short of establishing the existence of a planned or premeditated murder, robbery, with aggravating circumstances and rape. The state knew full well that the Schedule 6 bill application would subject the application to a burden which is very difficult to discharge. 
Ex post facto, the, the purported reliance on Schedule 6 has been exposed. The poor quality of the evidence of the state further exposed an endeavor on the state to avoid disastrous shortcomings in the state case. To us, the, the, the defense, these are nothing but amounts to sensational claims or simply difficult to prove accusations. The state made a promise, and I alluded to this fact. The state made a promise to the court that its case turns on the video footage, but later took a U-turn. Paragraph 8. It is now very clear why the state could not rely on a certificate as envisaged in section 6011A in caps of the CPA. As if this was not enough, no provisional charge sheet was filled by the prosecution. Nine, notwithstanding the above submissions, the evidence will meticulously analyzed with due regard to the provisions of both Schedule 5 and, and Schedule, Schedule 6 and Schedule 5 of the CPA, because um, the court had made that ruling. And we now proceed to spell out what Section 60.11a of Schedule 6 states. It states as follows. Notwithstanding any provisions of this Act, when accused is charged with an offence referred to in Schedule A, in Schedule 6, the court shall order that the accused be detained in custody until he or she is dealt with in accordance with the law, unless the accused, having been given a reasonable opportunity, to do so, I use evidence which satisfies the court that exceptional circumstances exist, which in circumstance exist uh, in the interest of justice, that, that the interest of justice uh, permit his or her release. Paragraph 11. Schedule 6 in relation to murder, robbery, and rape provides that. And I quote from that um, provision. It can only be murder if it was planned or premeditated. We, we, we have made submissions of that. C part of it, and this is crucial, rape or compelled as contemplated in that schedule, what is contained is that the only rape which falls under this schedule should be rape or compelled rape as con contemplated in section three or four of the criminal law, meaning the uh, law amendment, sexual offenses and related matters. Amendment Act 2007 respectively or robbery with aggravating circumstances. Now, let me pause here to mention the, the, this, this omission which is committed by my learned colleague. My learned colleague referred to murder, and if one reads the schedule, the schedule refers to section three or four of the Criminal Law of Amendment Act of 2007. And if you don't spell out very clear about this act, then the rape can fall under Schedule 1 or any other schedule. The same would apply uh, um, um, with rape, no, with um, robbery, with aggravating circumstances. They are, they are clearly governed by, if you want to classify them under Schedule 6, there are, there are requirements as per the Act as to what has to be mentioned. My learned colleague, with the greatest respect, never referred to this act. The SORMA Act, the CLA, Criminal Law of Amendment Act of 2007. The South, I, I proceed to read paragraph 12. The South African jurisprudence on section 11A, Schedule 6, made it clear that when an accused is charged with Schedule 6, bail should not be granted unless the existence of exceptional, uh, of exceptional circumstances are established by the accused, which bail is discharged on a balance of probabilities, and we submit that we have satisfied the requirement. 
by provide by giving this on record, viva voce evidence, they can come with ten or twenty affidavits. They don't one match, one single, consistent, reliable uh, witness who testified. Paragraph thirteen. As such, the section supra imposes a formal onus on the accused to adduce evidence to satisfy the court that exceptional circumstances exist which in the interest of justice permit his or her release. I have mentioned authorities as follows. Bota and, and, and Aner, 2002 in brackets 1, SCC Article 2, SCA. S versus Felion, 2002, 2, SACR. 550 SCA, and this cases, I've mentioned them deliberately because they're binding to this court. They're higher courts, and whatever principle, and according to the stare decisis, the honorable court is bound by these authorities. Continue, S. Mazibuko, 2010, Volume 1, SACR 433 KZP. It's a high court matter, which also binds the honorable court. Rudolph versus S, in brackets 2010, 2, uh, two all SA, 178 SA. Your worship will realize um, our authorities will rely either on constitutional court cases or SCA cases or higher court cases, which are binding to this honor court. We are not thumb sucking nor shaken, taken by feelings. We rely on the law. And the law is guided by the evidence standard in court and the facts. I proceed to read paragraph 14. If an accused has established a prima facie case of the intended prosecution uh, failing, there's a duty on the state to rebut he, the, his or her defense to that effect. Can it be said that the state, and this is said in S. V. Matevula, already cited it. Can it be said that the state rebutted the Viva Voke uh, evidence of the applicant? With the greatest respect, we submit there's absolutely no re rebuttal. And if there is any, because what we have, cross examination are just mere questions by my learned colleague. That is not. Evidence. The evidence is is the affidavit. The affidavit cannot be matched with the viva voce evidence. The viva voce evidence uh, carries more probative value compared to the affidavit. And later on, I'll show that in Killian, it was said that the applicant should have went for viva voce. And yeah. Now I proceed paragraph. 15, as I promised, this is now a constitutional court case. In S versus Lamin, S versus Laza, and others, S versus Jobert, uh, S versus Kitekat, 1994, Volume 4, SA 623, Constitutional Court, at paragraphs 76 and 77, the court found that exceptional circumstances beyond, are not circumstances beyond the um, yeah, circumstances uh, beyond the circumstances enumerated in section 60 in brackets 4 uh, to 9. I cite now what the court said in, and I say C as versus Lamin. At paragraph 76, the court, the constitutional court, which is the apex court, says, likewise, I do not agree that because of the wide variety of ordinary circumstances, in inverted commas, enumerated in section uh, 64 to 9, it is virtually impossible to imagine that what would constitute exceptional circumstances and that the prospects of their exist existing are negligible. In requiring that the circumstances be proved to be exceptional, the subsection does not say there must be circumstances above and beyond and generically different from those enumerated. Ordinary, the essence of it or the crux of it is ordinary circumstances can also be seen to be exceptional circumstances, cumulatively or individually. <coughs> Under the subsection, for instance, the accused charged with the schedule six offense 
could establish the requirement by proving that there are exceptional circumstances relating to his or her emotional condition that render it in the interest of justice that release on bail be ordered notwithstanding the gravity of the case. Other examples are readily to hand in the small body of the case law that has already been established in short period since the 1997 amendment came into operation on August, on 1 August 1998. I now proceed to read what the court said in paragraph 77. In conclusion, therefore, I am of the view, and it was, the, the decision was made by the Honorable Kekla, uh, who was then one of the highest justices and not an ordinary justice in the Constitutional Court under the guide of the Honorable Chaskalson, Chief Justice. So this should not be taken very light, and I, I guess my learned colleague will come up with another constitutional court case which um, nullifies this one. In conclusion, therefore, I'm of the view that although the inclusion of the requirement of exceptional circumstances in Section 60 a, limits the right enshrined in 35 1F. It is a limitation which is reasonable and justifiable in terms of Section 36 of the Constitution in our current circumstances. 16, in Arvisus Litawana, 1997, Volume 11, BCLR 1581, with Waters Rand in Johannesburg, has pointed out that in any further development of the principles of bail, every court is obliged to take full account of our Constitution in the light of the requirements of 39.2 of the Constitution that a court must promote the spirit, purpose, and object of the Constitution. I add, in addition to 39.2, I'll urge the Honorable Court to also look at section, the founding values. The, uh, freedom is one of the founding values stated in the Bill of Rights. It is also stated as a right in the Bill of Rights. Section 7 and 8, and if one read also section 2, spells out what the court has to do, must promote, protect, and ensure that these rights which are enshrined in the Constitution, guaranteed by the Constitution, have been taken care of. And here, right to dignity. I'm not concerned even much about freedom. My client said, once it is on bail, I'll stay at my parents' place, I won't go to the malls. Why? Dignity is infringed. And black dignity and white dignity should be equal according to Section 9 of the Constitution. It has no color. The Constitution is deliberate. It doesn't speak of any color. It doesn't say purple, gray, black, white, or what. It says all. Everyone. Proceed to read paragraph 17. In S versus DV and others, 2012, paragraph 2, SACR 492, GNP, the court held at paragraph 7, and I quote, an applicant in a bail application is given a broad scope to establish the requisite circumstances, whether they relate to the nature of the crime, the personal circumstances of the applicant, uh, which is the accused, or anything else that is particularly cogent. And then I, I have stated authorities as versus, versus Lamine. Personal circumstances to an exceptional degree may lead to a finding that the release on bail is justified. And I will show from also Van der Berg, if you read what defines exceptional circumstances. Ordinary circumstances on page 99, it is stated in Van der Berg that ordinary circumstances can be exceptional circumstances. Likelihood of acquittal, as we have shown so far, the state cannot say they've got a case of robbery, murder, and what? No. So much, and my learned colleague stated in his own words that 
the investigation is incomplete and is still pending. DNA, but even for rape, there's no need for them to look for the DNA. Because if it comes and it's positive, we are not worried. M1 and 2 solves the mystery for us. <coughs> May I proceed? And I can also mention that in page 103 and 104, in page 101 and 103 of Fanerberg, they say the preparation of defense is also an exceptional circumstance. Some authorities even go further that police should not effect an arrest, keep people in detention pending investigation. Because investigation can be done. You cannot get excited by t-shirts. I mean, that's, that's for the media. They haven't studied law. But legal minds you know, should know better. Here you're dealing with somebody who is mandated by Section 2053 of the Constitution. The, the police shall protect, promote, every, and ensure that we are safe. But here they are. With a t-shirt, we're going to lock you in, as if, as if the t-shirt is, is a million dollar asset. We are going to still keep you in detention. Now, the police are not mandated only by the Constitution, 2053, Section 2053. They are also mandated by Section 13 and 14 of the SAPS Act, 1995, and I do not hear anyone at the I.O. saying, I am working under the SAPS. I have been mandated according to the Constitution. In other words, if you don't mention it, then you don't, uh, you don't know it. And that is shown by the police assaulting my client. And even not reading any constitutional rights to him, and I never had the prosecution or the police regretting for this abuse. They even went to privacy. Open up your phone. Why? Because they realized they want to build a case with him. Why? They don't have a case at hand. And why do they, don't they have a case at hand? They can't explain how the body landed at that George Lee Park. They can't explain why the body was covered by a wreck. At what time did this body arrive? Why did they miss it? Why do they see it later on at 8.18 and not later, and, and not earlier? We are not losing sight of the fact that there are houses on the wall. If indeed a person is being killed by the accused person, they would have also checked for any markings on his body because people don't easily die. They, they die fighting, even a chicken, which some of us even eat in Christmas time. We slaughter. And the chicken, before it dies, it kicks. And it will leave some traces either on your clothes or any other thing. A question was raised that um, on your T-shirt, you, you, you are hiding your T-shirt because it had blood. In this statement, no one talks about it. As to where that a piece of evidence comes from, it baffles the mind. I proceed to read, and I wish to mention the following. There's a case called Nundalal. I can't quote, I can't remember the citation, but in this private prosecution of Mr. Zuma, uh, they dealt with it. There is, if, 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 if I can remember well, I think it's page 12. It refers to what is a prima facie case. It says a prima facie case is a case which at least has some real evidence, documentary evidence, and in addition, Viva Voca evidence to support allegations which are made. The standard is not high. It's not that of, of, of beyond the uh, guilt of accused. Now, another fundamental mistake 
I shouldn't miss this one. Questions were asked to the accused. I put it to you that the version you are given, you are giving, is not reasonably possibly true. No, that's a wrong standard. In a bail application, we're not dealing. We're dealing with the merits to show that the state case is weak. But if one says the version which you are giving is not reasonably possibly true, that's for the trial court. Another issue which was raised was, are you normal? And the court assisted. What did the court say? Maybe you should say, deal with a reasonable man's uh, issue, test. And the question was asked, are you a reasonable, do you think you are reasonable in the manner in which you behave? The reasonable test is only there to prove negligence. And the charges here is not culpable homicide. The element for murder is intention. In its three forms, dolus directus, indirectus, dolus eventualis. It has no negligence. It's not like poker, section six, which refers to ought to know, or knew, or ought to have known. So the issue about the reasonable, te the reasonable man test is misplaced with the greatest respect. Such questions were not supposed to have been allowed by the prosecution. And it shows that once the prosecution raised such questions, it was nothing else, and I say it with respect, an act of desperation, and they were moving the bail application to the trial court. And that is not what the court has to determine. The true inquiry is as to whether the accused has proved his, uh, exceptional circumstances, and it is in the interest of justice that he be released. I proceed um, to then read, is it paragraph 18? Then in S versus DV and others, paragraph 8, in the context of section 11A, <laughs> the exceptionality of the circumstances may be such as to persuade a court that it would be in the interest of justice to order the release of the person of the accused. A certain measure of flexibility in the judicial approach to the question is required. Who says this? It's not me. S. V. Mohammed, 1992, SACR 547, Cape Town, at 513, 4 to 515, uh, 513F to 515F, close bracket. N paragraph 9 there of this. It would be futile to attempt to provide a list of possibilities which will constitute such exceptional circumstance. To incarcerate an innocent person for an offense which he did not commit could also be viewed as exceptional. That's applicable to this case. It could not have been the intention of the legislature in section 64A of the Act to legitimize at random the incarceration of persons who are suspected of having committed Schedule 6 offenses who, after all, must be regarded as innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. In other words, and it does is in S. versus Jonas, 1998 to SACR, and then at 677 uh, Southern side of Eastern K. And I will show later on if there is a weak case which is suspect to serious doubt. That's also an exceptional circumstance, and it's applicable in this matter. Proceed to paragraph 19. The state, in its endeavor to advance the case of a planned or premeditated murder, uh, robbery with aggravating circumstances, and robbery, sought to rely uh, on allegations uh, by the prosecutor. The learned colleague deemed it fit to address from the bar. The heads of argument and the evidence of the investigation uh, inv and, and the private are some of, yeah, here we are anticipating and no heads are there. I think what I have to read is the evidence of the investigating officer and the private investigator are some of the, the uh, affidavits to be relied upon. And I proceed to say, to say as follows, the contentions by the state will be dealt with hereunder. 19.1. 
The facts as stated by the prosecutor are, are on record and I do not intend to repeat them. 20. If the state intended to allege that it was a planned premeditated robbery with aggravating circumstances and rape, it should have referred to these offenses as following, as falling under criminal law amendment. I've mentioned this point and I restated it was not mentioned. And if you look at the schedule, six, this criminal law amendment act, 105-1977, the spell is, is, is written in black and white. And that also has been dealt with in, in the Hua versus S. In brackets 2002, GOL 10257 SCA. Says if you put them under six, please mention Criminal uh, Law Amendment Act. 21, as demonstrated above, every allegation by the prosecution was exposed as not supporting the state's contention of any of the crimes preferred. I will briefly deal with exhibits, but it will be a repetition. I'll deal with them at a later stage. Now, submission further by the defense, and like paragraph 22. An accused is, in the absence of a conviction by a court of law, constitutionally presumed to be innocent. That is contained in section 35.3H, of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 108 of 996. 23, the grant or refusal of bail is a discretionary decision under judicial control. And judicial officers have the ultimate decision as to whether or not, in the circumstances of a particular case, <coughs> that bail should be granted or not. And it's contained in S versus Lamin. At Paragraph H to I, 89E and 90B to D. I wish to add the following. This discretion should not be used in an arbitrary, irrational, unjustifiable, unreasonable manner. It should be applied judiciously. 24. Exceptional circumstances as a concept has not been defined thus far. The constitutional court declined to define it, but made it clear in paragraph 76, which I read into record, that even so-called ordinary circumstances in inverted commas may serve to establish exceptional circumstances. See also S versus Rudolph, 2010, 1, SACR 26, SCA at 266, H2I and Moy, uh, Versus S 162 stroke 12, SCA 79. There is no onus on the state to disprove exceptional circumstances. The accused must, on a balance of probabilities, prove that the state case was non existent, weak, or subject to serious doubt. In this case, we, we respectfully submit satisfies this requirement. It's not even non-existent weak, it's a mirage. And it wouldn't satisfy a prima facie case. And to show that there's malice, I need to talk about that. To show that there's malice, we are not speculating to make a submission that that is why the I.O. who's sitting next to the prosecutor and the prosecutor chose willy-nilly which documents to give and not to give. And we strongly suspect at some stage, if this matter were to proceed, there are some shocking revelations to be found in the docket. Proceed to read 24, exceptional circumstances. In the, as has not been defined, I said, yeah, Rudolph and so on, uh, yeah. 25, an accused claiming innocence and that he will ultimately be acquitted must prove his future acquittal on a balance of probabilities. Our client did that. And surely, no one can come and say, he said in his own words, if I may quote him, under, cross, under examination in chief, under cross-examination, 
consistent and say, I took the clothing. Sunglasses I never took. I don't know where the story comes from. They searched at my place, never found any sunglasses. I take blame for taking the clothing and hiding it in the drain. He takes the responsibility. He's frank and honest. He takes this on the court into his confidence. He says, but the t-shirt <coughs> or the top, I took and threw it in a bin. And we asked him, it's price and so on and so forth. And we asked him as a follow-up, would you deny having committed a crime if state would prefer charges of theft or defeating the, the, the uh, he said yes because what did I do I interfered with the dead body when I didn't know that it's dead panicked took the clothing why and this for me and I want to wish, I wish to mention this the problem about reasonability is that it varies from one person to the other. Even today, I studied a long time ago. I'm told about the reasonable person. I haven't seen one. Because why? Reasonable man depends on the facts and circumstances mm -hmm. and the context given. Not so. You can't have one reasonable man. What's the color of this reasonable man? We can ask ourselves. Well, how does he stand? How does he sleep? What is reasonable in the circumstances by the police, the prosecution? Three heads in one and the private security. What could have been reasonable is to sit down, put the puzzles together to say, besides this young man who is black and 21, can we scout for another option and open up our heads and investigate on other avenues. No, they chose not, we're not going, that to us is reasonability. <coughs> if they failed, when they have state resources to can do it, my client doesn't have any state resources. He is a scared, frightened, shocked young man. He says, even when there are funerals in my family, I do not have the guards to view the date. And then now, in court, he has to be changed into this person who has to be reasoning so hard at, at divorce, the, the emotions which he was in, the state of shock, and to be right, to be quoted as, are you really normal? I find that, in fact, to be offensive to my client. It's an insult. Because my learned colleague is not a doctor, it's, it's just maybe a specialist in law, in prosecution, and maybe one of the best. Uh, but now I know Billy Down, sorry to say that. <coughs> Paragraph 25 then states authorities, as this is Matebula van der Berg, Bail, a practitioner's guide, third edition 232 to 4, at paragraph 7.16.5. Regards this as an, this issue about the as, as, as outrageous honors. When accused, a person confronted with allegations that he has committed a Schedule 6 offense does not make a prima facie case of the prosecution failing. There is no duty on the prosecution to present evidence in rebuttal. And it's also set in my table. Now, it shows if my client got in the box and was grilled or shattered by cross-examination and out of fear, in a state of shock, couldn't answer some of the question, the state, which had preferred a higher threshold, Schedule 6, wouldn't have had a duty to rebut. But they are rebutting because they see there's something heavy which they never anticipated. In other words, rebuttal means there is something. And it's not only one affidavit. 
that shows that it is trying hard to equal the evidence which my client tendered in court. When they had no duty to rebut, if they didn't have a duty to rebut, they would have said, what you're saying is bizarre, nonsensical. You don't pass the test of Schedule 6. You don't even deserve to be answered. We leave you like that to dry in the box. But no, it bothered them. <coughs> it really bothered them. And it even created some emotions sometimes. Paragraph 26, bail proceedings are not to be viewed as a full dress rehearsal for the criminal trial. And during the bail application, the duty of the court is merely to assess the prima facie strength of the state case against the applicant as opposed to making provisional finding on the guilt or otherwise of the accused. The making of credibility of his findings of the witness on the merits of the case against a bail uh, applicant is left to the trial court, which will ultimately be better placed to assess the evidence in its totality. In other words, and this is said in S. v. Van Vake, 2005, Volume 1, SACR 41, SACA at paragraph 6. The court is not here to make any evaluation about the guilt and, as, and, and prophesy on the acquittal. It is not its duty. Bail is very clear. It has jurisdictional facts and circumstances to satisfy excluding credibility findings and so on. Why? We don't have any full disclosure of the docket in accordance with S versus Shabalala. It's a constitutional court case. We, I must say, we had difficulties not only about disclosure of documents, but the difficulty of not knowing what's coming. We took a very high risk, and the court should take that, in fact, judicial notice to that fact. Your worship will remember that my learned colleague said the following when we're discussing the issue about Schedule 6. He said something to the effect I am adding uh, other charges. I'm not Mafiri. This is not the court for Mafiri. I have read the docket and I know why I prefer this. Knowing full well that there's exculpatory evidence which he concealed in the docket in the form of M1 and M2, assisted by his police on the left. So what we are saying here, and it's not a personal attack, please. I'm saying it with the greatest respect. But the truth, as painful and hurting as is, cannot be avoided. Paragraph, now we come to this question. Was the applicant's evidence truthful, impressive, reliable, and probable? And did the state unleash solid evidence? I asked this question at a time when I asked myself this question last night. I didn't have the affidavits. I was also speculating and hoping I'll, I'll find my ground. But at least my guts, it, to some extent, were right. Paragraph 7, it has repeatedly been said that an accused who elects to go by way of an affidavit rather than presenting view of okay evidence in a bail application runs a distinct risk. Recently in Killian versus S, in brackets 2021, in the Western Cape High Court, 24 May 2021, where the accused was charged with murder which resulted under Schedule 6 of the CPA. The Honorable Beans Watt J. Judge observed, uh, in my respectful view, correctly, that in choosing to attempt to discharge that honors on affidavit, an accused person runs the risk 
of not resolving disputed allegations which might arise in the process. Now, if I gave an affidavit, what could have happened? Because charges were added for the first time on the 13th, I didn't know about them. I was supposed to then postpone to then uh, go and change my, uh, what is that, affidavit. Or I would have then had no choice to take the accused and then put him in the box. So I had to choose between a rock and a hard place. Is that how the law operates? Fairness and justice does not do that to its human beings. And I, I'm saying we ran this risk with great success. And I'm very proud of the young man who is only 21 years of old at Varsity College. Although he didn't pass other courses, he's still young. To repeat a subject doesn't mean, to fail today doesn't mean you fail tomorrow. In fact, failure in life is a good instrument to teach you how to succeed in life. So some people realize uh, failure is, it means you are a failure. No, no person can be. Because it is only God who can determine our dest destination, not us as advocates or prosecutors or police. Now, I deal with comparative cases because there was an issue about the public outcry. There was an issue about the TVs and what a view. And I start with this case. I want to remind the Honorable Court about the case, and it's on paragraph 28, Oscar Pistorius and the granting of bail. I can inform this Honorable Court that the, uh, my colleague, Barry Rue, never ran the risk of taking Oscar into the box because he was not faced with this kind of situation. Him and Gerinel conducted themselves in a manner which befits honorable prosecutors and honorable advocates. They knew what, to be, what was to be in dispute and that is why the bail application didn't take ages. And I wish to also mention the following. It seems he was arrested somewhere in, uh, and appeared the following day. In other words, he didn't have to stay for so many days in custody, although there was direct evidence that he is the one who killed River and was ultimately found guilty but bail was granted to him. And if I'm not mistaken, even bail pending appeal, when matter was taken to the SEA, he was granted bail, despite the fact that there were women who were seen from the Women's League, the ANC, and so on, public outcry. The court applied its mind to the given facts. Now, when Oscar Pistorius didn't get into the box to subjected to so much scrutiny in the form of cross-examination was granted bail. It simply shows that the legislature never intended to deprive people of bail because it's a horrendous crime, it's gruesome, it's ugly, and it's against a person. I, this as this is Kamikel. I'll deal with the, all these cases. Now, let, let's... And I then gave it a thought. I checked because I did my research. I checked an article, and it's dealt on on page 21, 28, one, an article by Anthony Bourdain, constitutionally speaking, and it was published on the 19th of February, 2013. He succinctly states, and I quote him, the circumstances under which a court may grant bail to an accused person charged with a heinous crime are widely misunderstood in South Africa. Although the rules around the granting of bail are relatively strict if compared to any other constitutional democracies, a court is not supposed to withhold bail 
merely in order to punish the accused or to, to, to demonstrate disapproval of the alleged crime committed by the bail applicant. To do so would amount to a form of detention without trial, which was widely used during the apartheid era against political opponents of the National Party regime. It's not me, it's him. I'm, I fear that many South Africans, considering the merits of granting bail to murder, accuse Pistorius will lose sight of this important fact. And I guess what, this is what, what is happening in this case. And I agree fully with uh, uh, Anthony Bourdain. And he is correctly and precisely on point. He continues on paragraph 28.2 to mention that, and I quote him, as is often the case when decisions about bail are made, the public, and in bracket, in bracket, it must be said, sometimes also the presiding officer, he says, conflate the abhorrence of the alleged criminal act or, the sus or their suspicions about whether the accused might eventually be found guilty of the crime, on the other hand, with the question of whether exceptional circumstances exist to grant bail. On the, uh, uh, yeah, to, to be grant, to, uh, exist to grant bail on the, on the other hand. They then insist that bail should have, been, should, should have been denied. This is often in conflict with the human rights based interpretation of the relevant section of the Criminal Procedure Act that was provided by the Constitutional Court. <coughs> Proceed to read. He says, I know this is not a popular point to make. I'm also aware that some people might wrongly believe that in pointing this out, out I'm demonstrating an in in a in a insufficiently abhorrence of the crime that Pistorius is being charged with. But I, I would invoke the words of Chaskerson, of Justice Arthur Chaskerson in S versus Makwanyani, which is also a constitutional, to answer this conceptually muddled charge. He says, the very reason for establishing the new, Chaskerson said the following, the very reason uh, for establishing the new legal order and for vesting the power of judicial review of all legislation in the court was to protect the rights of the minorities and others who cannot protect their rights adequately through the democratic process. Those who are entitled to claim this protection include the social outcasts and marginalized people of our society. It is only if there is a willingness to protect the worst and the weakest, which are women, right? amongst us, that all of us can be secure uh, that our rights will be protected. The weakest are the women. And Pistorius had committed murder to River. In this case, there's no direct evidence. There's no direct evidence. No, we are not being told, even about the video footage, that we even have footage which shows the accused having this unknown instrument applying force to the accused. No one says absolute silence about that. And one wonders why. But the reason for that is nothing else but to show that this, even now as you're speaking, there's no evidence to support that. We have had the affidavits. Even the affidavits by both the investigating officer, they don't say X so my uh, and, and 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 or say if they don't want to mention the name somebody saw him somebody saw him doing this thing and i wish to mention that i will show the court most of the crimes of murder which are committed are committed in the houses of the deceased right and I can state the case of Ruade versus S, the businessman in Cape Town. Murders his wife, and he said that the wife was suicidal, right? And then what happened? The Honorable Judge Sally Trope uh, then, I know she's remarried. And I'll, 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 I'll show that what is she saying about this crime. <coughs> he was granted bail, notwithstanding fact that there was direct evidence pointing to him. He was granted bail pending appeal also. 
But what makes it so difficult with this poor little 21 year old? When others can get it, is there any equal treatment from what we can see from the cases which we are dealing with? We submit with respect that really, if, if, if we can ponder deeply to these cases, there are good guidance that bail is not meant to punish. It's not anticipated punishment. And as Mrs. Archison says that, by whom? The Honorable Mohammed J. Then, uh, the GJ at the Supreme Court of Appeal, but he was, he was in Namibia at the time. Proceed to read. As this is wrote in the High Court of South Africa, uh, case number CC43 in Cape Town, at page 6, paragraph 13, the court held, and the judge said, the victim of these offenses was none other than your wife with whom you had been married for 22 years. The murder of your wife was callous, brutal and shocking. Susan died a painful and gruesome death. She did not die instantly. It took her a while to die. She suffered in the last moments of her life, eventually succumbing to death. The degree of violence which you meted out at your wife was egregious, excessive, and exhibits horrifying aggression. You executed successive blows and fatal force in the taking of her life, completely disregarded her bodily integrity. It is a significant feature of this crime that you did not hesitate in commission, in commit, in commission thereof, for you did not call for medical assistance. Instead, you left her to die and you waited for her to die. Despite all this, he was granted bail on affidavit and bail pending appeal, I've said that. Now, I wish to uh, read um, what I found from a document by the Honorable Justice Meyer. There's a document here. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, this one. In this document by the Honorable Meyer, um, who is now the head at uh, the SCA, no? Sorry? Yes. Um, he, she wrote an article. And the article, the head of the article is Judicial and Legal Responses to Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. I'm not going to read everything. But on page two and paragraph number two, um, she refers to gruesome stories, which reminds her of Karabo Mukoyena from Johannesburg, who chart, whose chart remains were found in a shallow hole, buried like vermin. Riva Stienkamp, I've dealt with that. Former Banyana Banyana footballer, Yudi Similani from Guatemala, who was gang raped and grossly stabbed to death merely because she was lesbian. The brutal rape and killing of 17-year-old Anena Boyson, from Breda's Tor. Now, I will give this document to the Honorable Court to read. Nowhere in this document is she referring to Section 6011 as um, a legal weapon to refuse bail to all people who have committed these gruesome murders. I wish to hand this document to the Honorable Court and may it be mine. Can we get the copy? Oh, you can make copies, yeah, sure. Thank you. Now, what I'm simply trying to get at, these gruesome murders are not happening only to people in Santu. They are also happening in Kwate, Springs, Mamelodi, Mabupani, Durban, and so on. Now, are we to suggest that in all these crimes which are happening, all except for some which I've mentioned, including my client, must be kept in custody, whilst others are being released for committing the same gruesome murders. That would be unfair treatment, really. Then we would argue going forward and submit that there wouldn't be any fair treatment of accused persons. 
And that would be an unjustifiable and unreasonable limitation to Section 9, 10, and 12. Now, I then proceed to read, I say, see also, Tabeha Meda accused Arnold Tarblanche has been granted bail of one million in the Makanda court. The High Court set aside a previous order in the local magistrate's court, refusing him bail. Former ANC MP Sibusiso Kula was granted 50,000 bail after an appeal. He was previously denied bail by a lower court due to threats against his children. I refer this oral court to the recent case of Nandipa Magudumana versus S. For Magudumana, why bail was refused? It was refused because the court found, even on appeal, that she's a flight risk and no bail conditions will assist the circumstance to limit the risk. But we shouldn't forget that the other three, which I mentioned, Deboho, J.D. Polo, and two others, were granted bail. They were granted bail because they satisfy the requirements and it means each case is to be treated on its own merits, facts, and circumstances. You don't just wake up very early in the morning and uh, decide, uh, Makanya, I'm going to put him in jail. Yeah. And second to that, I know the Constitution doesn't work that way. It says Bill of Rights, and it says rights contained in the Bill of Rights are not absolute. 36 says limitation. Limitation has to be reasonable and justifiable. We submit there's no justification in the circumstances for this accused to be refused bail. Unless if the external reasons or factors which are beyond uh, uh, the factors governing the bail chapter. And we don't know about that. Paragraph 28. The evidence of both the investigator or officer must be viewed with great circumspection. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. The evidence of both the investigating officer and the private investigator must be viewed with great circumspection, particularly regarding to the behavior of the investigating officer and the prosecutor, and including also the private, failing to act honestly and failing by concealing exonerating evidence. This has to be seriously condemned by the Honorable Court. It needs the deprecation as, and to be condemned to the core. Now, I come to deal with the issue about the Section 40C. The likelihood, um, the attempt to interfere with witnesses or evidence as read and we, we submit. It will be respectfully submitted that there is no evidence before the court to suggest that if released on bail, there's a likelihood that the applicant will attempt to interfere with witnesses or conceal or destroy evidence. May I posit that? The question which was raised by my learned colleague in cross-examination says, if we release you because you concealed before, uh, then you might conceal other evidence. Which other evidence, really? And I wish to also mention that there is no proper basis. It is just unsubstantiated, mm. empty, and lacks weight. Mm. Because the standard of these provisions is likely wood. It is not just a mere possibility. You have to show that there is a likelihood, and this likelihood has to be supported by evidence. Not in the form of an affidavit. The best they could have done is to get in there, into the witness box, and behave like we did to say, why are we saying this? But an affidavit is nothing else but an act of cowardice for fearing that we might tear the case apart and make it even look worse than the worst state it is in at this present time. Now, 
we also wish yeah the, the, the witnesses also are unknown and it would seem state will rely on forensic evidence in the form of DNA his phone our client's phone which could have helped us to come with an exonerating version they have it it's captured it's 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 Mahunyela capture right and he said it in his own words please don't ask me too many questions i am going to estimate reliable information is in my phone but they say no 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 we have your phone but uh, yeah commit to a version it's unfair really <coughs> Um, let me then touch base on the, 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 the state doesn't tell us what happens with the keys and the phone. They don't tell this court we took them also for forensic. It seems they left them because they concluded we've got the right person. And that ignorance on its own makes one to wonder. Now, the other issue which the Honourable Court has to take into account is the issue about private investigators. Private investigators in our law are viewed as experts. Some, and not all, of the private investigators act unethical for them to get a check. They act like hired guns. They act in a biased manner to serve the employer. And in so doing, they will do anything, anytime, anyhow to satisfy their client. And we are submit that in this case, it's possible that that happened. Why do I say this? If the the family had confidence in the SAPS. Why did they leave this matter in the hands of the SAPS? Because the SAPS are there to serve everyone. The SAPS are catching the how train running. And they want to say, we were in Joburg when they caught it in something. I don't think there's a fair assessment. It's not their case, it's the case for the private investigators. And because they want to satisfy some people or their commanders, they catch the train. As to whether which destination does it reach, they don't care. <coughs> now, the the, we, we submit that the phone, the watch, which my client never took, the keys could have said a different story to them. Because how do you have the keys and when you're not driving? And the only version we hear she was walking. How do you walk with your keys under normal circumstances without having your vehicle? And we said, when we ask our land, there's parking there. Now, the other odd issue which cannot be left is that the photos shown stems from video footage. They did their own pick and choose. And it begs the question, why didn't they give us an opportunity to view it? I repeat, S versus Green, which was decided by Bus the late Busi L.O.J., says when the facts are centered around the video footage, it's a crucial evidence which might decide the case in favor of the state or the defense and might constitute a prima facie case, at least for bail application. And really, if we saw the video footage, we says, boy, 
we see you dragging the body. Boy, we see you having the rag. Boy, we see you having this instrument. Is that what do we see? We hear, do you see this picture? How's the mouth? But the, the, the question which is crucial, which has to be asked, who caused it, has been omitted. There's definitely silence to that. We submit that if proper investigations were to be done, they will find the right criminal. With the deficient, poor quality of evidence, this case is just going nowhere. I can inform Honorable Court, at this stage, at this point in time in a bail application, nothing would have stopped me if we were in a trial to bring an application for Section 174 on all the charges. <coughs> because there's no minimum of evidence as is contained in S versus Lubaka to can say to link my client with the crimes which are preferred here. What we see is just second guessing, trying to throw the mat on the wall and hope that at some point it will catch. That's not how the law works. Now about undermining the criminal justice system, section 40D, as read with section 68, <laughs> it is respectfully submitted there is no evidence that there is in existence a likelihood that the applicant, if released on bail, will undermine or jeopardize the objectives, uh, objectives or the proper functioning of the criminal justice, including the bail system. Cross-examination even didn't go to town with this issue. I, did, I don't intend to labor this point any further. I've dealt with exceptional circumstances. And uh, I just need a five, 10 minutes break to deal with the affidavits. I wish you will remember that uh, we are given this uh, two affidavits and I didn't get time to get any proper analysis deal with them, show how shoddy, sloppy, and wouldn't, and it does, they, the case doesn't turn on them. They, they've got nothing to add, save for playing emotions, and, and that's it. Um, so I humbly request, and I think after dealing with this um, affidavits, then I get to my conclusion, I wrap up. Thank you. complete. And then, but as it must first in the meantime, see you. Yeah. Yes, you make a copy there.
State recalls uh, case number 177, stroke 23. State versus Bafana Mahungela. My learned colleague was still busy addressing the court when we adjourned. Thank you. Let me have a picture one for you. Yes, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, just want to touch base with um, Van der Berg on 104, when he refers to some misconception regarding proof of exceptional circumstances. And it's on page 104. He says, although it will be clear from above discussion that the Constitutional Court has given its approval to the judgment is in S versus C, to the effect that the cumulative effect of the ordinary circumstance may suffice to establish ex exceptional circumstances. Too many unhelpful attempts have been made to give precise meaning to the term exceptional circumstances. Sadly, there appear to be few, few prosecutors who are able to resist asking the accused, why do you say you should be given bail? And what is exceptional about your circumstances? Whereas in law, no catastrophic event in the accused's life is required for exceptional circumstances to be found. Even more sadly, many a practitioner unnecessarily continues to attempt valiantly but vainly to elevate mundane domestic circumstances to an exceptional level, instead of studying the case law. Saddest of all is the fact that numerous judicial officers in both law and superior courts appear to be oblivious of the fact that ordinary circumstances may meet the challenge of section 6011A. I stop at reading. So misunderstanding, misconception, and I guess this, the, this misconception is the one which has kept us so long for so many hours, so many days, and we'll appreciate that the defense was not wasting time, but trying to deal with these misconceptions and misunderstandings. I now proceed, Your Worship, and I'm greatly indebted to the Honorable Court for the opportunity granted for me to get an opportunity to read this affidavit. And I'm also grateful to my learned colleague in helping out, otherwise I could have collapsed with shock after getting this, because there's been shock after shock after shock after shock with documents which were not supposed, which were not given time is. Now, two things I need to establish with this affidavit that these affidavits amount to nothing else but something which is quite vexatious and frivolous. They are incredible, to say the least. Let me start by saying this. And the other thing which I'll show is that there are material contradiction, omissions, discrepancies, and they don't tell you. They don't tell. You. But they show something which we were not aware of, which I will now bring to the surface for the Honorable Courts to appreciate. Now, I start with the uh, affidavit of Grant Molder. And it, if one looks at paragraph one, he says he's a security. I'm not sure as to whether it was a mistake or what, but my learned colleague said to us, he's got two affidavits. One of the private investigator, and the other one would be of the investigating officer. This person, we will show, is not a private investigator. In fact, at some stage as we read, he, go, he, go, he meets with the private investigator. So it, it, it shouldn't confuse the court that the security
security person is a private investigator. We do not have the statement. We do not have a statement by any private investigator. What do we have? A statement by a security officer, and we guess this security per uh, person could be the one who's working at uh, Glen Lee Park, Church Lee Park. Uh, those vans 24 7. Da -da -da -da. Now, let me start to critically analyze uh, what he is saying, and I will do it. There are too many loopholes. We'll stay the whole night if I were to delve on each loophole. But it suffice to say that I will deal with the most crucial ones. Now, this person on paragraph two says the following. On 29 October 2023, I received a call from our control room stating that a deceased family bo a female body. Now, once you receive a call, the control office is handled by a human being. It's not controlling itself. So he has not stated who he received. And this is to show that their version is totally incredible. We are not told who is she receiving. Paragraph three, on my arrival, it was established by whom? And established means it was concluded. By whom? Security person is now a medical person who can confirm. And if it was established, by whom still? It, so I'm trying to show the court here that too many questions, but less answers even, we do not get any responsible answers from these affidavits. We still sit with questions unanswered. We're still second guessing, conjecturing as to what really happened. Now, if one reads on the same paragraph three, it's, it, it reads, all her clothes and shoes were not found at the crime scene. It was established that her car, keys, and cell phone were discovered on the running path adjacent to where the body was found, right? Running path, we haven't had that before. She had been pulled down into a bush area, or it says brush area, down an embankment. By whom? The phone was picked up by a runner, Ms. Uh, Mr. West Paul. No affidavit from Mr. West Paul at around 8.18. It's double hearsay. At the time, though, at the time, thought someone had dropped their phone, according to his statement. Who was participating? According to his statement. We do not have his statement. So he knows about his statement. We don't have it. Mm -hmm. And he refers to the time at around 8.18. My draw caught attention to the following times. 7.35 was referred to, 8.05, 8.04, 8.06. 10.03 from M1, 8.18, and this 8.18 comes now for the very first time as to why it slipped my colleague baffles the mind. But it shows that we're slashed, the, 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 the person who's given this is one of the people who are slashing straws. They don't know as to what really happened and they want to lay their fingers where they feel it's comfortable. I proceed, and even, yeah, I said in cross-examination, this, yeah, Mr. Rana, uh, picked up by Rana, Mr. Westpaul, I, I, if I'm mistaken, I'll be corrected. I didn't hear this name being said. But if he knew about this 818, We humbly submit that as a responsible citizen who wants to get to the bottom truth of this problem, could have furnished a, an affidavit, put the court in a better light, not to hide and then somebody to refer to them. 
No. Paragraph 4. I received a picture of the victim which was taken on the day where the victim can be seen. From whom? We don't know. Wearing a light blue top, black pants, sunglasses, and a 10 pick cap. She can also be seen carrying her cell phone in the picture. From whom? This picture has a timestamp of 8.05. When one takes pictures, some phones or cameras do have the time. But we know for a fact that at some point we promised a video footage. And we're not sure as to whether the video footage is the primary source or the phone by the investigating officer or any other person. We are just given. And then this picture and timestamp was taken by Manuela de Nobrega Krobla at the start point. This name again, in cross examination, not there. But my Lenin's colleague had the affidavits with him mm -hmm. and could have known about this. And we could have asked our client, do you know Nobrega? Do you know West Paul? And I have no doubt in my mind, could have, he said in his own way, I don't know the witnesses in this matter. And there was no reason for my learned colleague, and if he wanted to bring such an application that I have names of people, but I don't want them to be published mm. for purposes of compromising the investigation, he could have brought such an application. Such an application was not brought. Mm. Paragraph 5. And worship, I start to show you how many video footages this person refers to. But not even one of them was shown to this on the court. The reason for that is better known by others, but not us. We, paragraph 5 reads, we started an investigation to assist the SAPS and obtain footage from a few premises in the area. Footage number one made me mark this number one. This was done in, in conjunction with my IT specialist. You see, IT specialists are very clever. They can manipulate pictures, do anything. That's why the chain custody is important. But for bail application, not so much, but at least show us something tangible to show that you have a prima facie case. Now there is now an IT specialist. We do not have the affidavit. The issue about the IT specialist surfaces for the first time. Not in cross-examination. We didn't know about that. Now the IT specialist, why? And, and if it were a trial, I would have applied X versus Texera. Uh, that an adverse inference be drawn for failure to bring a witness who would assist this court. But maybe in, in bail application, doesn't apply. I will have to ask those who know better. I started with the Sandhurst Pretoria School, which has a camera looking at the Western Pedestrian Gate at George Lee Park, around 50 meters from where the body was found around 31 October, oh, where the body was found around 31st October 2023. Mm -hmm. I don't know I'm that. That's what is written here. 31st October, now we have a new date, may also be marked 31st October 2003. <coughs> With regard to that, may I object? I've never uh, seen this practice of objecting. There's a court with this. There's never happened an argument that objections are raised. Uh, okay, thank you, Worship. Okay. Thank you very much, Worship, for your wisdom. Inte emotional intelligence. Um, now we have a, this date. 
it's not me who's creating. I never typed anything. It says 50 meters from where the body was found around the 1st October 2023. On this camera, I found an African male leaving the area in the vicinity at around 8.49 real time on 29, 2023. Now, this is there. Uh, are we still on video footage number one? Mm. All right. Maybe mark this video footage number one. 8.49 real time on another time has cropped up. On then paragraph six, on Monday 13 November 2023, we obtained and downloaded footage from 89 Olympia Avenue on the real time. It is estimated 8.52 that a person jumped out of the park over a locked gate near. Um, yeah, that's video footage number two, I'm right. Yes, that's video footage number two. Video footage number one was not shown to the court. We get to video footage which also was not shown to the court. Um, that a person jumped out and so on. Let's get to paragraph number seven of the statement. On around the 14th Parkmore, I discovered footage. That's footage number three, according to the statement, which was not discovered to the court for each to view it and be convinced that what is contained in this statement is, because video footage is real evidence. It's what you see, what you hold, what you, and so on and so forth, it's five senses. Right, from 78 Parkmore, where a person is seen wearing. We then went to 72. 8th Street Park Mall, where I obtained clearer footage, footage number four. On this footage, I can observe a tattoo on his right arm, above his right elbow. This was not even asked by the prosecution on my client about distinct features, marks, and yeah, we know S versus Intetto deals with that. Nothing. But this, yeah, and video number four, which was not shown to us. As if that was just not enough, let's get to paragraph number five. Paragraph number eight, we also obtained footage from the boom cameras. That's video footage number five. Then, then that uh, statement here, paragraph nine. On Monday, the 20th November, 20, I received information that the suspect was standing under a tree. About the informant, we don't worry. And informants work that way. And in fact, we are grateful to the, uh, to the informant because the fear which my client was living with, at least now, he's so much relieved that uh, the law has taken its course and he never ran away. We need to emphasize that at no stage did he try to evade being arrested. In fact, he cooperated. Now, I, 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 I read something here um, which says for around the, I received information that suspect was standing under a tree, 125 8th Street, Parkmore, for around three minutes on the day of the murder, which seemed suspicious. He's getting information from someone, and then it seems some suspicious. We suspect his statement. He, he is the one who's suspicious here. Yeah. On the 25th, I spoke to the, yeah, this is the point. Earlier on, I said, 
the security is not a private investigate. Why do I say this? My basis is simple as what I'm going to read. On the 25th of November 2023, I spoke to the private investigator, Klaus Molebaloa. Now we are clear. Who at this stage has joined the investigation mandated by the deceased family? And ask him to go to the above mentioned address. He checked a stormwater drain and he found the victim's head in the drain. It's common cause. But a version was put to the accused person. You took the clothes. You put them. And what next did you do? Put them in there. Why? I wanted them not to be seen to be seen. But we are not told the class, the private investigator. Right? Now this security person says I went to the private investigator. Now the question is, how did you know that class Mulebola is now tasked uh, as the investigating officer? Well, we'll leave that to Mother Nature to take care of it. Now, 10, yeah, yeah, 10. We downloaded footage from the address. That's footage number six. Now, We downloaded it from the address and determined that the same person disposed of the victim's head and other items in the drain. He then moved back to see if the items were visible. That's what he said, confirming our version. He pushed more items in the drain, which, which are now, because you can't see more items without being specific. He pushed more items in the drain and dropped what looked to be clothing. Okay, fine. He then put that clothing into the left side of the drain and proceeded to walk up 8th Street. Paragraph 11. The father of the victim did send me a reference picture. Now let's look at the spider web. Spider web will involve now the security, the IT specialist, the, the private investigator, class Oh, who's class Malebola? And then, eh? now we have the father. It's a spider web. Now, the father of the victim just sent me a reference picture. How, we don't know. Of the head, and it matches the one found in the drain. How, we don't know. Because what we know is that Items has been taken to forensic laboratory for DNA and so on, isn't it? The sentence SAPS duty detective came out and put the head into an evidence bag, something which I said now, and put it at the station and the IO was informed. So as it were, we are still awaiting results. Because then, it's, it's in an evidence back to be taken for forensic. Paragraph 12. On Sunday the 26th, I accompanied the investigating officer, whose name is not mentioned, to 145 8th Street Parkmore, which was established. Hey, established is a very beautiful word in, word in this um, affidavit. To be a possible address of the suspect. The SAPS investigating officer arrested. Now, what is he confirming? It is confirming that the police and the private investigator effected the arrest. That is in line with what our client testified. Now, the spider web is now growing. The policeman has joined in. And what is their primary task now is to get this young man 
who they merely link by a top, a blue top. Is that sufficient for murder? Premeditated? Preplanned? Is that ample proof for robbery with aggravating circumstances? Is that enough to show rape? I respectfully do not agree. By, by mere wearing, and we have shown to this honor court, and we, we promise that we will submit that the charge which can, might hold, because after getting the docket, the honorable court must never ever forget that I still have an opportunity to peruse it meticulously and see what I can do. I can either do representations, and based on this bail application, I wish to also mention this one. Based on this bail application, section 22, I guess, of the NPA Act, doesn't stop me from bringing any representations to the NDPP because I, I, I wouldn't even follow protocol and being guided by the seriousness of this offense. I will definitely take representations to Shamila Batohi, Ms. Shamila, Advocate Shamila Batohi, and explain that here you've got a, a tin which is leaking underneath. The more you put water, the more it goes down the drain. And you must remember that water is a scarce resource in the country. Now, I have said that. Now, let me deal with the last aspect pertaining to the statement. And this is a part where my learned colleague doesn't like, but I can't. My friend says, deal with it. If it saves my skin, please do that. Now let's look. I have informed this oral court, and the charge sheet will also show that I first appeared on the 5th. And my letter confirmed that he saw my letter to Mr. Mafiri. And whilst appearing in that other court, I requested for a video footage as per as Mrs. Green, as previously alluded. Magistrate dismissed me and said, you will deal with that with the prosecutor, but I'm ready for you. Well, I said, thank you very much, Russia. Now, then Mr. Mafira, as I said, showed me uh, the, the picture and he said, someone is coming. It's okay. I appeared in this court and after appearing uh, on our first day, which was on a Wednesday, 13th, no? I wrote a letter, I think on the Thursday that I was requesting the suspect's warning statement, video footage, video footage, and there were three things, eh? video footage, yeah, I was asking for a video footage, uh, a statement and the PM. I understood my lens colleague that he was not around. On Monday morning when we met, I said, did you see um, the letter which I wrote? He confirmed that he saw it and said to me, the PM you will get, but not the video footage. We don't have it for now. And we are going to use affidavits. And I hope I'm not misquoting. And indeed, uh, then I wondered, uh, why are we changing now? Because previously, when he was addressing, he said, he spoke about one video footage, and not six, five, or any other number. But this statement then shows that video footage which the person is referring to is not one but six of them but not one of them was shown for the court to observe what is said in the affidavit that on its own weakens whatever strength this affidavit intends to have
it reduces it, its value from if it were 10 cents, it's zero now. But as if that was just not enough, as I was asking, on the eve of the 13th, when we, had, we were coming here for the second time, the affidavits were made. They are stamped as 12 12 2023. So, which means if they were made at 12 12 23, then they were at the dock, in the docket on this date or the following day. And hence, that is why my learned colleague could, could inform me that don't worry about the video footage, we'll utilize the affidavits. He knew about the affidavits. Now, I think that suffices about the, this affidavit, which according to us, with the greatest respect, it carries no weight. I now move to the statement of Obri Chisan. I'm not sure if it's the same on the one Obri Okay. It seems this name is the same as the one of the investigating officer who is in court, who was pointed by my client that he hit him badly. And that version was not challenged, even in cross-examination, which means my learned colleague concedes that indeed that happened. Because if it didn't happen, they were sitting, both of them, and, and, and they, when my client pointed at them, that if my colleague suffers from some selective amnesia, then the I.O. is there and BDK also is here to assist, to say, hey, you live in something very important, constitution, in violation of the Constitution. But the, the three of them, they always say two heads are better than one, but not in this case. Now, we get to this um, case of Obrich son. He says, and I'm, I'm sorry, Your Worship, it's not numbered. And, and let me start by saying, this, this same affidavit has a stamp. L let me say that this first affidavit has a stamp dated 1212. Um, uh, South African Police Services, Detective Office, Santin. It's important that I put that. And then the second statement by the investigating officer has the same stamp date and everything. And it's 12 12 23. Let's check the times. This first one was made at around about 14 hours on 12 12 2023. This of the investigating officer was made at uh, 12 hours 30 on the same day. Now, um, that has to be noted. Then he says about his personal number. Then he says, I'm the investigating officer. I was tasked to investigate. I'd wish to know who's tasked him to investigate because they have to be cited in case we prefer civil, a civil claim. Uh, by a member who was on standby for serious and violent crime. During the crime I uh, seen, visit, I was informed by whom, we don't know, that the deceased, the deceased was joking while others, while others, they were running and she was walking, reason being that she was pregnant. Now, I wish to remind the Honorable Court that during testimony of the applicant, a question was put that indeed this lay, uh, the late um, Christian was not running but walking. But I can remember the interjection by my client to say, but how could it happen that he was, she was running where there no other people? That question was posed. And the answer to it by my learned colleague, quoting him verbatim, was, don't worry, that will be dealt with in the trial court. 
So now this statement says, do diligence was not done. The I.O. says in his own words, this person was running with other people. Aren't you supposed to pursue them? Get statements from them. They, were, they are part of the crime scene, if it is. But that, that didn't happen. While running, and he is informed, by the way, we don't know by whom, that he was talking and so on. So it's, there's a double hearsay I'm referring to. While running, one witness picked the cell phone from the ground. Eh? While running, one witness, whose name is unknown, Pick the cell phone from the ground around. Now, let's check. This first statement referred to a running path. This one says from the ground around 8.15 and handed it to the timekeeper, who is also the witness on this matter. We don't know the timekeeper. And it would seem they're talking about two different phones because the one that the security is referring to is the one which is discovered on the running path, but this one is on the ground. Now, and handed it to the timekeeper, who is also the witness on this man, count their laps during running. After everyone finished their laps, it was discovered that one lady did not complete her laps, and they started their own investigation to look out for the state. Were these people also not supposed to give affidavits? They were supposed to give because he was not there and he cannot talk as uh, the first person to be on the scene or could have witnessed what happened. They then went back to where the phone was found and conducted a search and the body of the lady uh, in Parker's deceased was found on the bushes wrapped and naked. Version given by the client. I didn't leave her naked. After taking off the clothes, acted in a very decent and civil way, even when shocked, I closed her with a, with a drag. All role, role players, I think it's supposed to be role, but it says role players, was called to attend the scene, and body was removed after from the scene to the bro. Mature. We don't know at what time, by whom, and how. During the attendance of the post-mortem, I was informed by the pathologist doctor that the cause of death was blunt force, head tra trauma, strangulation. Now we know the policeman does not have to be informed by some public officer who is in the forensic pathology. They usually give Two, one, two statements. Mm. And it is for a simple reason. A two, one, two, you depose to an affidavit and it's binding on your conscience. But this is not it. During the attendance of a post mortem, I was informed by the pathologist. Uh, after the post mortem was attended, I went back to the crime scene to investigate and gather evidence to assist trace the suspect on arrival. At the scene, I was informed about the camera, which is at Sunhurst Preparatory College School, which is next to the crime scene. Footage of the day of the crime committed was viewed, and saw so individual coming wearing a blue t-shirt carrying something on his hand on the side or next to the crime scene, and more footage was collected on the surrounding after scene. The first footage to track down this individual. Same argument I raised about all the six footages, they are not before court. And the prosecution have to give reasons. Why are they not here when they are crucial? Witness statement was then taken from people involved during the jogging, where it was established. They used the same uh, kind of terminology, established also. <coughs> the timekeeper took a photo of the deceased when she had to do her last lap at 8.05 a.m. And the deceased was wearing the blue t-shirt, glasses, and trousers. And now, so I have dealt with that. It's information which is double hearsay. Camera footage, then I proceed to read. Camera was read on the park where I saw the deceased come uh, around at about 8.04. Is the 8.04 you refer to? And 
on the photo we, we, we saw 805. It's not a material thing, but time counts in such cases. I also saw an African may pass the camera footage from the entrance around 805. Now this 805, according to him, he sees um, the male come past the camera footage from the entrance. And the 8.05, which my learned colleague refers to, is the time in which the picture was taken. That's material contradiction. The issue about the tattoo, we have no problem with it. But we are saying it was not dealt with in cross-examination. Then he continues to say, after I viewed the footages and analyzed the time frames of this, it came to my attention that the witness picked the phone at around 8.15. How does he arrive at that? He was not there. Say for discussing the case. And it boils down to the spider web. And the deceased entered the park at 8.04. And the timekeeper took her pictures at 8.05 meaning the murder occurred in the period plus minus eight minutes. And the, no, 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 dangerous. He's now treading on very dangerous ground. It's speculation, conjecture, and assumption at its best. How do you arrive at this? When you have, when you are relying on information from other people, and here he says it as if he's absolutely certain about this incident, but the same six video footages, not even one of them, shows how the disease got in there, who put the wreck on her. Um, it seems all these video footages were focusing on only one person. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll, 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 I'll submit your worship that that park is a public park. It is for people. It cannot be that all these video footages are capturing only one person and not any other person. They have to ex explain the exclusion of other people because they were there. I then trace that individual coming from the crime scene wearing t shirt. We, we dealt with that and we considered to that. And, and he also, also talks about so many footages. I come to camera footage and so on. Investigation continued and the drain was open. We have dealt with that. At this point in time, informers, we dealt with that. Um, I then conclude that the suspect was following the deceased on the day of the murder by looking at uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if someone who is reasonable can be so gullible. You just view and you create a subjective impression and opinion that, and you arrive at this very serious, dangerous conclusion. And I submit that the Honorable Court doesn't have to, to, to really take this serious. Um, the, the gentleman is doing everything to ensure that he links. But the link depends on the evidence, not him. It's, it's in this one. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sure. At this point, um, I then concluded that the suspect, in fact, by simply concluding, this investigating officer becomes a witness. Together with, then I proceed to read, together with the information received that the deceased was part of the jogging every time it happened, I concluded that the suspect may be monitoring against speculation, being friends with conjecture. Maybe, and the word maybe confirms the guesswork. Because it's not saying, I'm saying it with absolute certainty, definitely. This is what happened. Because he was, he was not in the scene. 
But another dangerous thing coming, and it's shocking, really. Um, I conclude the suspect may be monitoring the deceased and plan to murder her by me looking at a footage. And I measure the suspect's distance from where? Because two photos were shown, and my client stood firm on his version to say, you cannot compare the two. Talks about the shades, and, 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 and no other evidence challenged that. It's, it's shining like a bacon. It's, it's uncontroverted. <laughs> Plan to murder her, and I measured. Unless if he's a soothsayer, I don't know. Uh, I measured the suspect distance from this place of residence, place of residence, which gave me plus minus 1.4 kilometers. So if I stay 1.4 kilometers and someone dies uh, some 1.4 kilometers, then I become a suspect for murder. Really, this is even not laughable. It, it makes one to be so sad that you are not safe in this country with the SAPS institutions failing victims and accused persons. This is gross dereliction of duty at best, if not gross incompetence. By using the route he had used, I mean, again, recreate. He's, an, he's not a reconstruction expert, but he arrives at this. This and, 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 and this will humbly request that the Honorable Court turn its blind eye, overlook at it. It was not even put in cross-examination by my learned colleague about a 1.4 and even given a chance to cross-examine again. He never spoke about it. He never intended speaking about it. It was not part of his ploy, strategy, or tactic. And then, and then really, he's trained. The prosecutor is trained and, I guess, is even experienced because for you to be in the regional court, it doesn't just easily come. You start at the district courts. Uh, then the procedure I therefore oppose bail of the accused yeah, based on all which has been said, of the accused, uh, no, 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 mm -mm. I'll be remiss. Uh, now, be based on this second guessing and the kilometers uh, which the lady stays away from, 1.4 kilometers, he now says, my client has committed, oh, he has pre-planned or premeditated. I ask questions. As you moved from Tutumani in Alexander, any intention to murder any person? When you arrive, uh, when you caught your text at Penn Mall, intention to murder? No. And when you were in Park Moor, any intention to, when you walk to the sentence spot lab, any intention to murder, when you got into the resident, any intention to murder, that was not challenged. But my learned police officer comes to this conclusion. I therefore oppose bail of the accused person as the accused planned to murder the deceased. As to when he started planning, we don't know. And he wore, instead he says where, the her t-shirt is wore, her t-shirt after murdering her. <coughs> Another dangerous conclusion, uh, raped the body. And I wish to say, the police official had the M2 with him. But look what he says here. In light of the M2, you can't arrive at this. Murdering her raped the body to cover her from seeing and de destroying the evidence by throwing it in inside the drain. His answer to that. And they took the clothes. The only thing which Mightland says, I threw 
into the bin, which they didn't find, is the top. And then I'm just at the tail end. Um, if the suspect must be released on bail, members of public or community will be on danger and safety of himself, from whom? And the suspect must remain in custody now. Uh, uh, it comes to that issue of the public outcry. I've read S. V. Makwanyani's constitutional court case. Public opinion doesn't play any role. Um, and I've shown to this honorable court that it's unfortunate and quite regrettable that we live in a South Africa which is not safe for both males and females. And we are part of the defense, part of the, we, we as part of the defense are crying out loud that there has to be safety, people must live in peace and harmony in the country and ensure that crime is reduced to its lowest levels. And it is therefore just not right to think, and we submit, that this accused person by mere t-shirt there's a link, and if we were to release on bail, when Pistorias, the Rhodes, and every other person were released, I find these guns to be superfluous, to be not holding any water, to be unconvincing, unpersuasive, misguided, misplaced, and lack a lot of Jews if they were an orange. They're dry, they're unsubstantiated. And we submit that based on these grounds, denial of bail to this accused person would lead to absurdity and injustice. I therefore want to conclude uh, by saying the fact that the police are saying they still have to investigate, it means the investigation is incomplete and should not be used to keep the applicant in custody unreasonably. The court in S versus Bennett held that the state should arrest should not arrest merely to complete investigations, but that there must be a reasonable possibility that someone has created have has committed a crime. In S versus Jonas, uh, it was said exceptional. Uh, circumstances might be constituted by the defense showing that the state case is weak. And in Africans, weak means that's Jonas which is saying that. And we submit that this case uh, is the one which is referred to in Jonas. The factors in section 6040A to E, as I previously alluded, deals with the likelihood two, the likelihood two, and not even one of them was um, dealt with to satisfy that likelihood, and no evidence was produced to satisfy that requirement of the likelihood. The likelihood at the highest standard of just a mere possibility, I said that. In conclusion, it is respectfully submitted that the applicant has proved that there are exceptional circumstances that permit this release. In the event of the Honorable Court ruling that the applicant is entitled to bail, appropriate conditions and a bail amount will be addressed upon invitation by the Honorable Court. I know it has been a long address. If there are any questions, Your Worship, I'm more than willing to answer. Yeah. 
Thank you. Bishop, indeed, so it has been a long address, but there's nothing wrong with that. My learned colleague was basically doing his work. Your ship, uh, the state will pray that uh, we arrange another date for purposes. Stop doing what you're doing last time. For purposes of the state presenting its case, the argument, as well as the state is of the view that there are a number of uh, things that it needs to respond to in terms of the address of the defense. As the defense has taken almost five hours, of, or if it is not six hours, the state is of the view that it needs to address the court, and the state is of the view that it will actually be failing in its duty if is not addressing this court properly with regard to some of uh, averments, allegations. We're not going to concentrate on personal attacks. We'll simply deal with the case. The state is then requesting a remand. Unfortunately, tomorrow and Friday, state is not available. The state will request the remand until next week. I'll suggest the 29th. Yeah of no. December. Ah. No. I would suggest the, the... May I just finish? Okay. I would suggest the 29th of uh, December for purposes of that. I know that uh, uh, Your Worship, uh, today is your last no. day, yeah. and uh, this was made mentioned to both the state and the defense. No. But... Uh, the state will humbly request that uh, that day, that is Friday, surely will proceed and finish the matter. Yes. May I remind my learned colleague um, that postponements are not there for the taking. You've got to give reasons. And I'll refer him to a section, section 168 of the Criminal Procedure Act, which deals with um, the requirements to be satisfied for for a postponement to be granted. It has to be reasonable and it should be necessary in the circumstances and it has to be applied for. You don't impose yourself on the court and set dates. The court is the one which has to decide on which date. Now, and I refer my learned critic also to R versus Atchison. The second ground of my, my objection is that it cannot be that the state which has its docket, we didn't know. We were given documents here in court. We had to adjust from time to time. For instance, I slept around about 3 o'clock last night preparing these sets of arguments. And my learned colleague knew at all relevant and material times, and he even said it in his own way, I have read the docket. So things which I'm raising now, for instance, the affidavits which we referred to were given to him on the 12th of December, right? Now, we who were told about the charges with a charge sheet which was not filled on, on the 13th adjusted and short. And I wish to remind him, I'm not being personal, he kept on saying I'm wasting cost time. Now, he must explain to the Honorable Court as to why did he agree? In fact, it is him who suggested that and said, tomorrow I'll read the affidavits and then we, we can argue and close. Now, all of a sudden he's a chameleon now. He's changing color. It's not fair. Your worship, bail applications are urgent in nature. Why are they urgent in nature? It is because freedom, liberty, of a human soul is important. Now, what we want to address, that this kind of behavior is unfortunately borders on punishing an accused person to stay long. 
right? And to show them and abuse his position as Dominus Litus. And that cannot be. Because he is a free man. My client is in there. And now he's abusing his powers. We should sit back and relax. Worship, please bear with me. And I am frustrated. Because these affidavits which he read today, I didn't know a thing about. Now, when did I get time to prepare for them? If preparation is so, is a reason for him to postpone. I, I would agree, be agreeable to a date like tomorrow. And not next week, really. Because it took me, not knowing what's in the affidavit, to write my, and what should we realize, I also had difficulties in addressing because I didn't know what's coming. Now, I find the uh, request to be totally ill-founded. I'm not going to respond to a personal attack. My learned colleague knows very well that even if we proceed, we'll, we will not be able to finalize this matter today. Reason being, at 3 o'clock, we need to be done. Because I started here at 9 o'clock, we did not even go on lunch. That's the first reason. The second reason, a quite a lot of affirmance. State will actually be doing injustice to the family of the victim, worship. Also, as well to the applicant himself, we need as a state to clear certain issues that have been raised. Surely, at the time that he kept on asking for short attendance, he knew very well that we'll be having less time. The state is making a humble request, to ship that the matter be postponed. Um, the state, the application for postponement, Mr. Bacona, are you available on Friday? I'll not be available on Friday, Your Are you not available? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Musaka, are you available uh, 29 December? Your Worship, I... I was supposed to do other things. I prioritized this matter, and that is why, even on the previous occasion, I'm the one who asked that we sit from Monday to Wednesday. And I wish to also remind the Honorable Court that I had to do away with other witnesses precisely to expedite this matter. Um, 29th, uh, I have no choice, really. I have no choice. But it should be noted that this is just nothing else but an abuse of power. Do I have an idea that the worship uh, will be able to give a judgment on the 29th? Thank you very much, worship.
No, but I can say something very informal. Um, if need arises on that day, I will prepare my short reply. Thank you. I just to alert the court about it. Maybe we should reply. So I'm going to be prepared. Um, I'll give you the reply in the morning before we start, right? Don't know what you open. Before we start, I'll give you the reply. No, I am a big. I am a big. Why don't we draft it for the <laughs> no, we can't do it for them, don't worry. We can avoid it. No, no, the public outcry is, is outcrying. No, 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 Exactly. The job is properly done. To show that uh, you must take a win, man, at some point. You know? <laughs> if you're taking loss after loss after loss after loss after loss, <laughs> take your wins now, you get it. <laughs> Even if it means you must steal, you must bully to get that's sadistic propensity. That's what we call sadistic <laughs> propensity. That one for Ralph Libya. Yeah? It's fine. Which one? This one's going to be sued. Don't Libya. This one? Yeah, I spoke to these ones are going to be sued, let me tell you. No, they are not there for the day. Yeah, they are not there for the day. Someone's phone here. Bye bye. 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 Bye yeah, we, we, we prepare on it like no one. We know what we're going to say. Yeah. We already know. So you guys are not going to come to the race? Uh, if you want to come here, you're going to have to arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
No, they can help me carry the German G so we can stand somewhere there. What? The German G, so we can move to that side. Oh. Mm -hmm. Something. Did you move Come to me and my hands, remember? Yeah. I just don't want you to be just like this, this top of the thing. You know I'm like not the tallest person on earth. We acknowledge you're both very smart. Just trust and tell us whether this boy's got bail or not. Mm. 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 You or 
hands up. Yeah, just put it there. It's, is that yours, Tina? It's mine. You have a few last kiss. Ich habe die Hand auf der Hand auf die 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 Hand au